Well, thanks for coming uh, to Science by the Glass in our November series, um, sponsored by the Climate Science Center here at Texas Tech University. Today, you're in for a treat. We have Dr. Uh, Jeff Lee. And who in here, let me see a show of hands, who knows what aeolian means? Okay, we did have some hands, but maybe 20%. So, uh, Jeff Lee is a physical geographer whose main research area is aeolian, and aeolian means wind-related. So, trivia question. Um, geomorphology. His current research topics include sources of blowing dust in Texas and the American Southwest, and the causes of dust storms in the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. He is co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Aeolian Research and is secretary-treasurer of the International Society for, Aeolian, for Aeolian Research. He teaches the introductory course in physical ge geography every semester. Other courses include geography of arid lands and the nature of science for teachers. Okay, so help me give, giving, uh, give him a warm welcome and thanks for being here. Thanks, sir. So the Topic for tonight is: Are we headed for another headed for another dust bowl? Can we go to the next slide. I don't know. Thank you. You've been a great crowd. <laughs> Drive safely. Uh, all right. So maybe we need to move on. We're going to spend a lot of time on the old dust bowl and a little bit of speculation on the future. It's a little hard to see, but that's the Tech Theory Barn about to get engulfed by a. Um, uh, a dust storm back in the 1930s. Okay. Um, the short version of the Dust Bowl of the 30s is we settled the plains and we used farming techniques to be able to farm in such a, uh, an arid environment or semi-arid environment. But by the 1930s, the Great Depression hit and major drought hit at the same time, and the result of that is what some consider the worst environmental catastrophe this this country has seen, which is uh, the, the dust bowl. Okay, officially, the dust bowl is more or less this part of the Great Plains, north of us, up into Kansas and Colorado. Uh, but there's no distinct boundaries, and if you go back to the 30s, there was massive dust blowing throughout the Great Plains, well up into Canada. Okay. Uh, leading up to the whole settling of the area, which led to the, the dust storms, in the early to mid-1800s, this part of the country was known as the Great American Desert. The early explorers might have shown up during a, a drought and just said, this place is never going to support a, a settled human population. Um, and it was pretty much established that you just couldn't farm west of the 100th meridian. And the 100th meridian is the east edge of the Texas Panhandle. Okay. Um, now, later in the 1800s, the railroads built across the Great Plains, and their incentive for doing it was the federal government gave them a whole bunch of land, and they needed to make money off that land, and the way to do that was to sell it to farmers who would then use the trains to transport their, their crops, but the Great American Desert didn't work very well as a PR slogan. And somehow they came up with uh, the idea of rain follows the plow. It, yeah, it's dry out there now, but if we settle, that's going to permanently change it to more rainfall. And there were some bizarre theories of how that was going to happen, but we won't go into it. But by the 1880s, there was a pretty serious drought that hit, and that was pretty obvious rain follows the plow wasn't, wasn't going to work. So they still wanted to farm the area, but the trick was, how do you do it in such, such a dry environment? Okay. All right. 
People had been farming in arid and semi-arid areas starting in the 1840s with the Mormons in Utah, people in California, people in Montana had been doing it, and learned by trial and error what worked and what didn't work. On the plains, most of the techniques were developed by a fellow named Hardy Campbell, and it was the Campbell method, and he was hired by the railroads to teach farmers how to, how to farm. Okay. The trick was you need to maximize the soil moisture. So below the surface, you want to compact the soil. That draws water up through capillary action into the root zone. But you need to keep the water there for the, the plants to use. So you need a mulch of fine material on the surface to cut down on evaporation. And that was referred to as a, uh, a soil mulch. Um, wind erosion was a problem, and they knew it was a problem, but it was way down the priority list. If you can't maintain soil moisture, you're not going to farm. And over time, these the soil mulch, which started out, what they wanted was fairly large particles. Um, with less and less organic matter in the soil year after year, and especially when drought hit, um, that be went from being small particles to a fine powder. People talked about um, the soil was like space powder by the time we got to the 1930s, which would be very easy to blow away. So, good. Okay, this Campbell method of very carefully manipulating the soil. Uh, ties back to um, Jethro Tull in England in the 1700s, who really got farmers working on getting the soil just the way you wanted to maximize yields. So it was that Jethro Tull, not, not <laughs> Jethro Tull. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, all right. Anyway. Anybody over 50 really thinks that's a funny joke. All right. All right. Now, the one issue with this dry farming is every time it rains, it messes up your soil mulch. Then you have to get out and plow, plow the surface and build up that mulch again. And again, you want gravel size aggregates plots on the surface, but without organic matter and without moisture, they just couldn't maintain it. Okay. Now the economic side is 1930s was the Great Depression. This is a worldwide depression. In the U.S., unemployment of 25%. Um, and out of that came several what are called New Deal programs that, that Roosevelt got started, and the Dust Bowl played a prominent role um, in, in the politics of all of that. Okay, now by the 30s, most farmers had gotten rid of their mules and had bought tractors. With tractors, you need more land. And so to get more land and to get tractors and other equipment, they needed mortgages. So. Um, the plains was the perfect place for tractors. There are no trees in the way, the soil's there, you don't even have rocks getting in the way. Um, so big equipment was advantageous if you could afford it. Okay, so they've got mortgages by the time we get into the 30s. Go ahead. Okay, so the farmers are in debt for land and machinery, and in the 30s, a big drought hits. And, um, there's no irrigation, except maybe a, a little garden for vegetables. The crops do not have any irrigation, so you're relying totally on rainfall, and the rainfall went way, way down. So, um, the economic side of this is maintaining your fields costs money, and they weren't getting much uh, income, and it became difficult. All right, good. Uh, here we have the 1930s. This is wheat harvested in the states that make up the Dust Bowl. In the 30s, only about, it, at its worst, only about half of the planted acres even got harvested. Okay. 
next. The yield of what was harvested was way down here in the 1930s. The yields are much lower, okay? And the prices just plunged because of the Great Depression. So farmers are not making any money or very, very little money, and it takes money to farm. Um, yeah, that's wheat prices. We get the same in the next one. This is cotton, same basic idea here. You can see the incentive back in the teens to come out and farm on the plains. Um, this is adjusted for inflation prices, but uh, a good crop could make you a whole lot of money. Okay. All right, the drought is the other big part of this story. This dark area was in what's called severe drought for more than half of the 1930s. And most of the rest of the 1930s, it was still in pretty serious drought. Now, us down here, it wasn't quite as bad as it was a little bit further north. Okay. Uh, here's rainfall for Dodge City, Kansas. You can see the 1930s a number of years at much below um, average rainfall. Here's Lubbock. Um, the drought in Lubbock wasn't nearly as bad as it was further north. Uh, but when you get to the 1950s, we had the much worse drought. And that's the drought of record for the historical period in this part of what we call the Dust Bowl. Okay. Uh, in that 1950s drought, especially down here, the drought was much longer and more intense. We had a whole lot of dust blowing in Lubbock in the 1950s, but the economy was in much better shape and farmers knew much more of what to do, and so the, the impact on the region wasn't nearly as bad. It was still bad, but not nearly as bad as the 30s. Okay, so what ended the Dust Bowl? By the end of the 30s, the drought ended. Crop prices increased, especially as World War II got started in the late 30s. Um, various government programs were involved. Some areas were simply bought up by the federal government, supposed to be the most erodible parts of the Dust Bowl, and turned into grasslands. And we still have the national grasslands out there. Uh, farmers just learned more. They gained through all those years of experience. The soil conservation got established in the 1930s. And they did research um, on how to, how to manage farms to reduce erosion. They set up demonstration farms in various places, and they would invite farmers to come in and see what works and what doesn't work. And they simply provided advice. Okay. Uh, various conservation practices, the ability to plow more deeply and pull clays back up to the surface, which can help hold the soil together, got going after the 30s as equipment got more powerful. Uh, plowing along the contour, it's pretty flat here, but there's still contours. Um, terracing. Wind strips, leaving a strip of grass or something to cut the wind blowing. And after, mainly in the 50s, we got into irrigation, which greatly increased the ability of farmers to, to get a crop and, and make a living. Okay. Um, so the Dust Bowl of the 30s was caused by what I'm calling the perfect storm of wind erosion. It was inappropriate, well, not inappropriate. Farming practices that enhanced erosion along with major drought and economic uh, catastrophe. So, okay. So then we get back to, will there be another Dust Bowl? And the obvious answer is it depends. Um, what, what's gonna happen to land use around here? What are gonna be the economic conditions around here? What's the climate going to do around here? 
Uh, irrigation plays a big role in agriculture around here. This is, these maps are from uh, the TTU Geospatial Technology Center. The green here is where we have most of our irrigation. The red areas, and this is 2004, the red areas have less than 30 feet of groundwater. And there's just sort of a general rule, once you get below 30 feet, you just can't do traditional um, irrigation. There's just not enough water there. So the green areas are where we have enough water, and we're doing a lot of irrigation. So that's 2004. On the next one, if we take the decline in the water table leading up to 2004 and ex extrapolate that to the future, by 2025, these areas are not going to have enough water for irrigation. And now that doesn't mean they're going to stop irrigating in 2025, but there's a, a trend that way, let's put it that way. And by 2035, these are the areas where current methods of irrigation are not going to work. Um, so irrigation is going to greatly decline over the next few decades. That's, that's pretty clear. They're working on updating these maps with more current data. But, okay. So with less irrigation, there's going to be more dry land farming. There's already plenty of dry land farming going on. But dry land farms, especially during drought, are much more likely to blow and are much less economic uh, during the dry years. In wet years, they're great. Okay, so dry land will continue, but only if it's economical. And that's going to depend on what technologies are developed, uh, what the economy is doing, what government policies are going on, and what the climate is going to be up to. If we don't move that land that's currently irrigated into dry land farming, then what's, it, what's going to happen to it? Maybe grazing, maybe something I can't think of. Um, or it might simply be abandoned and people walk away. That's not out of the realm of possibilities. Okay. So compared to the 1930s, we know a whole lot more about managing the land to reduce erosion, um, and we have much better technology to do so. So there's hope for the future. Uh, wind energy is another, seems to be going to have a big impact on land use around here over the next few decades. And But what happens there depends a lot on government policy on prices of other energy sources, economic conditions, attitudes of landowners, and on and on and on. And the big question for our topic tonight is what's going to happen under the turbines? Is it going to be farmed? Is it going to be managed? Uh, we'll see. Okay. Then there's what's the future climate of the region. Here I Totally don't know. There are some people in this room who can speak a lot more authoritatively on this, but I bet they won't tell you that they know exactly what's going to happen. Um, it's probably going to be warmer. It might be wetter. It might be drier. Um, we might have longer droughts. Um, and other things very important to wind erosion, what's going to happen to wind, what's going to happen to uh, humidity, and so on. We just don't know what's going on. Um, Tom Gill at UTEP and I did a paper, and I helped him try to come up with what factors influenced the drought of the 1930s in the Dust Bowl region. And I'm not going to go through this, although there will be a quiz. Um, you have to look at what's going on in the Pacific Ocean, what's going on in the Atlantic Ocean, what's going on in the Gulf, what land use is happening, how much dust is in the air, all of these things come together. Many of them influence a lot of other factors, and it all leads to either more or less, uh, or drier or wetter conditions. 
So the future economic conditions, what's going to happen to the economy of the region as irrigation goes out? Will, it be, will wind make up for it? I don't have the answer to that. There are people in here who probably do have the answer to that. Um, what's going to happen to crop prices? What government policies? We currently have a whole lot of land around here in grassland, which is the government policy of the Conservation Reserve Program, and that has significantly decreased the amount of dust, but we think it has anyway, since it was instituted back in the 1980s. Um, somebody may decide we're not going to pay for that anymore. Um, and the national economy, the international economy, it all affects what happens down on the farm. Okay. So will there be another dust bowl? I don't know. Um, I would say it's not likely, but not out of the realms of possibility. Um, and it all depends on a whole bunch of things and how they've been running. So, thank you. <laughs>
my impression is the west is getting drier, the east is getting wetter, and we're right in the middle and have no clue. So. Well, she knows the house a lot more than I do, but it's just unsettled, unstated. We don't know. So, um, based off, of, I'm talking about the historical uh, dust bowl. Um, was it uh, inevitable? Was it going to happen anyway, or was it exacerbated by the, by human intervention? Well, the human intervention of farming made it possible. There was always there's always been dust blowing out here long before Europeans arrived, um, but they was usually following fire um, and maybe drought played a role in that. So there. There's a long record of blowing dust going back to the 1850s when people started writing stuff down. Um, but we made it a whole lot worse. So Jeff, I just want to make one comment. Uh, the, the CRP program is impending. Is it? Uh, yeah, and it not only has impending, but it ends. And about two thirds of the land that there was in CRP has already been converted. Most of it is being converted to grow crops. Okay. If they decided that the only economically efficient program that they actually had at USDA, they had to get rid of so, yeah. <laughs> We did work years ago on the record of, of dust and loving. In the mid 80s, when CRP starts, there's a dramatic decrease in the amount of dust. So that could influence our future quite a bit. Michael, is that Michael? Michael? Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, essentially, but it came out right before the farm bill. Um, it was just the it was just the optics of paying people not to grow food. But of course, they were paying to grow food on places that shouldn't grow food. So. If you couldn't hear all that, the CR Conservation Reserve Program is phasing out, and that grassland is already being converted to to farmland. Yes. Okay, if the future uh, water supply is actually a problem. You feel like our state government is adequately addressing their problems? Is the state government adequately addressing our future water supply problems? I'm not the expert to ask. My inclination is some people are trying, but overall, no. Um, but now let me back up. I don't. I think that there are plans. We're supposed to have a plan for the next 50 years. Just how seriously that will be followed, I don't know. Because there are people that are saying that water rises as a legal property right as opposed to addressing conservation and having the entire problem. Groundwater in Texas has always been owned by the landowner. I think that's starting to change, but that's been into the story since Texas started. Jenny. Yeah, my question is actually related to what you said about um, the trends from the 1980s, and I think you're around 2001 when you're looking at the dust in West Texas. Okay. So, and I know you're doing more work on this. Do you have any preliminary results that showing what um, we've been seeing from the dust in West Texas now? I do not, but we will in a few weeks. Do you have any of what we've seen? I think it's been quite low for a long, so long time. Right yeah. It's been low yeah, it's from really the 90s to today. Uh, that's a separate project. Oh, okay. So, but, but, but if it goes down here, what are the chances of that's what If CRP, with CRP going away, um, it'll probably increase. It probably, my guess is it won't get outrageous. You know, we bitch and moan when we have a dust storm, but this is nothing. Um, what's what's going to increase? The, the amount of dust with CRP going in. The Conservation Reserve Program is, is a federal program. The idea is farmers take the most erodible part of their land and plant it around here. It's to grass. And they don't even graze it. They just plant it to grass. And they get a yearly fee for that. Um, so now they won't be able to do that so they can't be paid to that. Now they won't be paid to that, so, so if it's economical, they're gonna plow it up. Plow it up. Yeah. So it's going to cost. 
Yeah. Ian. So, uh, dust that gets picked up in the air has to land somewhere. Um, are we gaining uh, uh, more dust than we're losing? We should have an answer to that, and we don't. Um, question is, the dust that's eroded in one place is deposited somewhere else. Uh, are we gaining or losing? My guess is we're losing, but not. In the 30s, there were areas that lost a foot of, of topsoil. Nothing like that is happening now. And yeah, every field loses some and gains some, but I think the net loss from the region it, well, is a loss. Where is it going? Where is it going? Mostly east. Um, 1930s dust has been found in Greenland in the ice. Um, ships at sea in the Atlantic were measuring dust in the 1930s. There's the great story of Hugh Hammond Bennett, who basically got the Soil Conservation Service started. In the early 30s, was scheduled to testify before Congress about the need to protect our soils. And he saw the weather reports and knew that a Great Plains dust was coming to Washington, D.C. And he delayed his testimony for a couple hours. I forget exactly how. But when he started talking to the, to the members of Congress is when the dust started coming into the Capitol. And so he used that to his advantage. And yes, Mark, that has been looked up, and it's not just a, an urban legend or rural legend. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Whether it's a dust bowl, another dust bowl, or not, really is a matter of uh, semantics. It's more that either way we're going to end up finish out the uh, irrigated agriculture is finished in very, very short years. I told you more than I knew in my slides. <laughs> There's the idea of the Buffalo Commons of buying up all the land and putting it back into a park. That was talked a lot more, talked about a lot more 30 years ago than it is now. But, but, but. Well, thank you very much.